Well, good evening, folks, again, and welcome to the Mid Ulster Amateur Radio Club Tuesday Night Lecture Series. Uh, we're very privileged uh, this evening that we have along with us, Mister. I'm gonna I'm gonna use a formal title, Mister. Mike Richards. Goodness who, me. <laughs> who has who has literally written the book on this topic. And uh, I've always wanted to introduce someone who has literally written the book on the topic that we're about to discuss. Oh, so, uh, uh, raspberry pie and all it entails and everything else. So, uh, Mike, you're very welcome uh, indeed. Along Thank you very with much. Us. And uh, it's great to have you along. Um, so, uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to start... Uh, Maybe introduce yourself, tell us uh, yes, uh, what you do and everything else, and um, uh, or uh, how, how long you've been even interested in the topic of Raspberry Pi, how it started, and then it's completely over to yourself. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's a long story. I've been involved in electronics and computing since the year dot, really. Um, I used to build radios with my dad when I was a lad. Um, and I've stayed around radio and electronics. Um, I went into music, joined a band, did all those sorts of things, ended up building amplifiers and all the rest of it. Um, but the Raspberry Pi came when it was first launched, actually, I got involved in the Raspberry Pi. because so it just struck me as a really interesting little board because um, I played around a lot with Arduinos and things like that. But the Pi just looked um, that little bit different, that you had a proper operating system that you could work with. And it took my fascination, and I've, I've been with it ever since. Um, I've owned every Pi there's ever been. <laughs> I've got several of them here. <laughs> and um, I've, one of the things I saw as a possibility for it, because I've always been involved in the data modes, was using the Pi as a data modes terminal. And it's been gradually getting more and more um, effective in that role. And now it's to a point where it's actually effective for SDR receivers as well. So it's, um, I've watched it grow and they've done a fantastic job, the development team, to produce a device that uh, is so powerful and so adaptable for such a good price. You know, when you when you look at the prices of it, it's um, it's amazing what they've done, and it's built in the UK as well to boot. So yeah, so do you want me to take over the screen and I'll do my presentation? And uh, is that fine? Yeah, absolutely. Over to you, Mike. So the floor is uh, yours, or shall we say now the screen is yours? So <laughs> <laughs> off <Okay>. you go. <laughs> Thank you. This might be a bit messy at times. I'm going to share my whole desktop because I'll be popping out of my presentation to various things. So we'll start off with the whole desktop. So that should be me up with the entire desktop. Can you confirm I've got that? Yeah, yeah we've got that. We yeah. can see that. No, no issues, Mike. So you should have my slide pack up there now. Okay, so... This is the start of it. So this is a modification of the slides that I did for the RSGB. And I've skipped some of the um, early stuff about all the different Pi models because I think you've had another presenter has given you that and some of you may have watched my presentation. So there seems little point in going through all that historical stuff. So I jumped straight in really with the Pi 4 which is the latest incarnation of the Pi and probably the most significant one that they've done. But we'll go on to look at the Pi operating system and some Pi applications and there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, I'm very happy to accept questions during the meeting. I don't know how you normally manage it, but if people want to text in a question, you can um, fire them at me as we go if, you, if it's appropriate or I'll pick them all up at the end. Well, uh, how we usually do it, Mike, uh, I've said it there that people can unmute themselves. Uh, what I would only ask is that if you do want to ask a question and you're happy to just introduce yourself with your first name and your call sign, and then uh, you know who, who you're talking to <laughs> as well, Mike. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, the more the merrier. So let's get into the, the Pi 4. So it it's a brand new processor they've used for the uh, Pi 4 because they've reached the limit of the technology that was being used for the previous Pis. <clears throat> so it's an all new quad core 64-bit processor. 
running at one and a half gigs that powers it. And um, there are various models available. And it started off with a, a one a gigabyte model but that was soon dropped and now it's a two or four or an eight gigabit um, of ram models uh, to be honest for amateur radio work you rarely need more than two um, gigabytes most amateur radio programs are very conservative in their use of memory it's not like a windows machine that you ramp up the memory you get a faster computer uh, it's got a dedicated dual port graphics processor and that means that you can run two um, HD displays off of this. So you can run one, uh, one monitor at 4K, 60 frames per second, or two 4K resolution at 30 frames per second. Or you can mix it up, you can have an HD and a 4K, etc. So you can really make a really nice big installation with the Pi 4. Uh, it still uses a micro SD card as the system drive. So those that are familiar with Win Windows, you've got your C drive where your operating system lives and all your programs. With the Raspberry Pi, it's done on a micro SD card. And the reason it's done like that is quite simply because this was designed for the education market. And so it's dead easy. If you get in a pickle with the Pi, you can just whip the SD card out and put another one in. Um, so it makes it really easy to experiment with the Pi. You can put completely different operating systems in, etc. cetera. Um, there's uh, also network and USB boot coming soon. Because at the moment, the Pi will only boot from a micro SD card. But <clears throat> coming out soon is the facility to boot from an externally connected uh, hard drive, okay, on the USB port. So that's very close to coming uh, coming out now. You you can see a beta version of it if you go on the um, Raspberry Pi website. Uh, network booting uh, is important for schools because it means when they start the classroom up and everyone boots up, they boot up from the same image that's contained on the network so that all the kids have the same operating system with the same program. So that's particularly important for the education market rather than for us. But there might be some instances where it's useful for amateur radio. So it's also on the board a dedicated serial camera and display ports. So it will take the dedicated Raspberry Pi camera, which is a smashing little beast, uh, and you can use the display port to drive the Raspberry Pi uh, touchscreen and various other touchscreens without using up any of the other ports. Uh, one of the really big changes with the Pi 4 is that the Ethernet is now full speed gigabit Ethernet. There was a bottleneck previously with the Ethernet and the USB ports. And this was because both of those ports were actually served from an internal USB port on the processor. So it had to be shared between those two ports. So they were always speed restricted. And if you were doing something which required a lot of data traveling through the, the USB port and out the Ethernet port, the thing choked very quickly. But now we've got full uh, gigabit Ethernet speed. And on the USB ports, there's two USB 3 ports, which are full speed USB 3 ports. There's also two USB 2 ports. So that's a really big step forward. That's the, one of the major changes with the, with the Pi 4, that those bottlenecks have been uh, got rid of. You've also got onboard Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigs and the faster 5 gigs, uh, as well as the latest Bluetooth 5 on there. And it's also ready to take power over Ethernet, which can be quite handy if you need to mount a Pi remotely because you just have the data cable supplies the power and the uh, the uh, uh, ethernet connection <clears throat> you have to put another little what they call a hat a hardware attached on top device to plug in the top to do that but um, they range between 10 and 15 pounds each for those so it's not a big deal uh, the thermal management's been improved. Um, you'll see from that picture that there's a, a metal case device in there. That's the system on a chip device, which has got the processor and the graphics processor unit, et cetera, and various other things in it. They changed to a metal case to help with the heat dissipation. Uh, but they've also changed the firmware on the board to reduce the general heat dissipation on it. And for those that use 
uh, serial ports to the Pi to do various things. Like, for example, if you're using GPS uh, board to get really accurate time, you need serial ports. In the previous version, the hardware serial port was used by the Bluetooth, and you had to do some fiddling around to swap out the Bluetooth uh, in order to get access to that. But now you've got uh, four hardware serial ports, extra hardware serial ports on the new processor. So this is what it looks like. So um, they've changed the layout slightly in that the gigabit ethernet port has moved from one side to the other um, just to help with the layout. Um, and down at the bottom there, the composite video and audio is all combined into one 3.5 mil jack. And it's one of the four band jacks, a bit like you get on your iPhone, etc. So it carries the video and stereo audio output. By default, there's no audio input on a Raspberry Pi. There hasn't been on any of them, and there still isn't on this one, which is why we use external USB audio cards. And you can see here the HDMI ports are two um, micro HDMI video ports to serve the two outputs. Power is now a USB-C plug which is much better to the old micro USB. Uh, a lot of people had problems with the old micro USB, mainly due to poor quality USB cables. It's very tempting to buy these nice, soft, luxurious USB cables to make connections. But in the main, the reason they're all soft and luxurious is because they've got tiniest conductors in and their volt drop is too much for the Pi. Um, so by having a USB-C, it's much better um, stability on the power supply. Uh, and across, across the top is the 40 pins of uh, general purpose input and output that's been around for a long time now. And it's stayed standard since the Model B Plus, I think it was. Um, so, and it fits the same physical template. You know, the mounting holes are the same place as the previous boards, etc. So it slots in very well. And one of the problems with, um, with all computers as you increase the power is there's more heat to be dissipated. Um, so we've got the metal case, etc., and they've improved the firmware to increase the efficiency. And the Pi 4 will run most tasks quite happily um, if it's uncased, just as a bare PCB. But as soon as you put it in an enclosure, the temperature will rise very quickly and the processor starts to throttle back once it gets to 85 degrees. So we need, for most applications, we need to think about cooling. There's a lot of people selling tiny little stick-on heat sinks. To be honest, they don't really make much difference at all unless you're blowing air over them. Um, so they're not the solution. So what's the solution? So I've got three solutions here for you. Uh, and I've got all three here that I've been using and trying out. Now this aluminum armor case is very nicely uh, made um, solid aluminium case. Um, it's got, as you can see, thermal pads and um, raised profiles that actually sit on top of the hottest um, chips in the board. So it takes the heat straight out. And it's got a metal base as well as a top. So that's quite good at dissipating the heat. There's no airflow over it. It's just um, convection. But it, it does work well. And for what it is, I think it's quite a reasonable price at £12. Um, it's very nicely made and you can get it in all sorts of wacky colours if you want that sort of thing. Um, so you've got those thermal pads in there. So the other thing, probably the simplest and most effective uh, cooling solution is this tiny little fan shim that's produced by uh, Pi Moroni and just costs £9.90. Uh, and it's a tiny little 30 millimeter fan with the control circuit on the PCB. And all you do, it's a friction fit over the GPIO pins. So there's no soldering, you just push it over the GPIO pins. And um, the holes, if you like, are slightly out of a line so that they're a friction fit over there and it picks up the power from that. And it's really, really thin and you can still get up the GPIO ports. So if you want to put another board on top, you still can do that. And this really knocks the temperature down. As you can see, it sits right on top of the processor, blows directly down on it. And I found this to be a really effective um, way of keeping the Pi uh, cool. And now the other slightly more um, sophisticated, uh, whoops, 
oh yeah, we've got a Python app for speed control on this, which will monitor the process of temperature and wind the fan up and down um, so you don't have it running all the time. But I found it's really, really quiet anyway, so I just leave it running all the time, figuring the cooler the pie is, the longer it will last. So the next one is this rather nice case. It's, it's £25 from Pi Hut. And again, this is uh, an alloy, metal alloy case. It's got the thermal pads, but it's also got a lot more. It's got a little fan built in, <clears throat> but you'll see that there's this additional board here that um, is connected, and there's another board in the head of the unit. And what it does, it moves all the inputs and outputs around to one side of the unit. So if you've got a, a complete project that you want to enclose, it does a really nice job. There's no room for anything else in there other than this. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's complete. And it gives a really um, neat finish. Um, and so you've got the fan under there keeping it cool. That little panel that I've arrowed to there is held in place by a couple of magnets. And underneath there is all the GPIO pins. So you can put a connector in there to take the GPIO pins out if you want. But it's a really neat solution. Another nice feature that it's got as for a complete desktop project, if you like, is it's got a proper power button. Because the, the power, Pi itself doesn't have a power on off button. Uh, you, you pull the power out basically when you want to turn it off and plug it back in when you want to start it up with this one you've got a power button that behaves as you would expect from a computer so um, if you press and hold it for a few seconds it will immediately cut the supply and shut the machine down whereas a short press will start it up so um, really works well so i highly recommend that as a very nice uh, neat case that works well so the other Pi model that uh, I'll look at here is the the Pi Zero. It's a super cheap minimalist Pi. It uses just a single core processor, um, but it's still only four pound sixty, including VAT. For uh, and it'll run the Linux operating system complete with a desktop and everything else. Might be a bit sluggish, but it'll run it. Um, so you've got a one gigs processor and five hundred and twelve megs of RAM. It's got the Pi camera connector. Um, and you can get the 0W version, which has got Wi-Fi on it. And you can see down here, this little triangle at the bottom of the board is a rather novel slot antenna for the Wi-Fi. Um, so this has 2.4 gigs Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth as well, which is a great little board. <clears throat> and you can have it with or without the GPIO pins actually soldered in. This is a bare board, but you, you can have the connector soldered in if you like. So that's the, the layout of it. So you've got the usual micro SD card for the operating system. It uses a mini HDMI port. There's the Wi-Fi antenna, a single micro USB port, and a micro USB link for the um, DC input and the serial camera. So it's a really good, um, useful little model that. <clears throat> now the Pi operating system is going through a process of change at the moment. Um, they've dropped the Raspbian name, it always used to be called Raspberry in all the previous iterations, but it's now called the Raspberry Pi operating system. Uh, it's derived from Debian Linux, Linux and it's currently a 32-bit operating system, um, which is interesting because when you look at the 4 gigabit, gigabyte Pi and the 8 gigabyte Pi, a 32-bit operating system can't use all of that memory. It's unable to access it. Um, but there is a new 64-bit operating system that's in beta testing at the moment. Uh, and you can, um, there's a link in some of the links I've sent up, that you can download it and have a go with the 64-bit uh, one. So the standard distribution includes a whole uh, useful range of programs and there's loads of free software available uh, using the software app. Um, and it has all you need for a home computer. So if we just break away from this a minute and go to a demo. So if I, uh, that's the one I want. I pull this one in. So now <clears throat> we're looking at the Pi desktop of a, um, this, this is a two, no, it's a one gig Raspberry Pi, an early Raspberry Pi. Um, standard installation. So if you look at the 
all the programs are down here. That's the start button up there. And you look in the programming. If you want to try your hand at programming, there's a huge range of development environments that are already installed here that enable you to play with programming, all sorts of things. So it's a really good tool to learn with. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's really good about this is the inclusion of LibreOffice as a really good office suite. Um, so if you go to LibreOffice Writer, for example, um, this is their word processor, and it's fully compatible with Microsoft Word. Um, so for example, I, just this afternoon, I moved one of my uh, documents uh, over from my main computer that was um, uh, written on um, the latest Microsoft Word. So here we go. So we put that in and you'll see it comes in with all the formatting exactly as it is on Word. Um, and you can edit it on here, save it back, send it off to Word again, and it all look exactly the same. So it's a really good um, application uh, for, for doing general office stuff, uh, writing letters, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, in, in with that, of course, you've got all the other things. So you've got Calc, which is like Excel base, which is a database system, draw uh, fairly obviously is a drawing, program uh, and impress is a powerpoint like program and it will take powerpoint slides from microsoft powerpoint and play them and you can edit them etc uh, and um, there's all sorts of other things in here there's obviously some games uh, as well as useful accessories and everything so as a operating system system to play with it it really works rather well um, this is the web browser up here which is based on Chrome uh, and um, and this works really well uh, as well and enables pretty quick browsing and <clears throat> as you can see we're going through quite quickly and it's quite responsive so it works quite well it was a nice little computer to be honest so that's um, the Pi operating system. So let me just come out of this one and go back to here. Knock it up to there. So we've done that demo. So what do you need to get going with a Pi? You need a keyboard and mouse. Um, I use the uh, the Perex Peridu range, which are quite nice compact keyboards, but they use full size keys, which I find quite useful. But virtually all the common keyboard mouse combinations will work, including Bluetooth. Um, Ethernet is the fastest and easiest to use with the Pi because it automatically um, gets itself an IP address when you plug it in and there's nothing much to do. But having said that, Wi-Fi is very easy to set up as well and works well. You've got high speed Wi-Fi with five gigahertz gigahertz as well um, and the display a standard HD or a 4k and dual monitors is all supported for power there's lots of ways you can power the pipe to be quite honest you you can use the standard 5 volt power supplies you want about 2 to 3 amps in fact here I'm using a, um, a RAV power unit which is um, designed as a multi charger for mobile phones which has got six outputs on it and it's powering about three or four pies here Ver perfectly happy with that sort of thing mobile phone packs are also really handy i use those because uh, i i like the wildlife in our garden i've got some raspberry pi cameras and i'll often move them around the garden and just use a mobile phone pack to power it and um, they'll keep it going all night quite happily you can use LiPos with a boost converter. Or power over the Ethernet, as I mentioned before, is really good if you're going to put the Pi somewhere remote and you want to minimize the amount of cable into it. Feeding it over the Ethernet works really well. So one of the things um, you might want to consider is you don't necessarily want lots of keyboards all over your shack if you're using the Pi. So an alternative way to operate is what's called headless which is where you remote connect in to the Pi and use your main computer keyboard. And it's what I'm doing here to show you the Pi. Um, and the great thing is with the Pi, it's included um, in the standard distribution of the Pi is real VNC as the application. It provides full remote access to the desktop 
and you get a free online account for up to five computers so you can have internet access from anywhere in the world to your Pi, which is quite neat. Um, <clears throat> the other way of doing uh, remote access is to use what uh, use SSH, which provides just command line access to the Pi. And to, to enable these, that you boot both of them via the preferences uh, menu. So we're doing a quick demo of real VNC, so I'll show you it here. So this is the real VNC panel here. And as you can see, I've got several set up here um, that I'm using. So I can go into, these are four different pies. So this is a, a four gig Pi running an SDR um, uh, set of programs. This is the one that we looked at just now, which has got uh, the basic operating system on. This is a Raspberry Pi 0W that's configured as an iGate. Uh, and this one's running Lin HP SDR as an SDR receiver. So I can go into any of these from here just by right clicking, choose connect. And then we go, I'm into that Pi and I'm operating it just as though I was there. Um, and it's really, uh, really a useful way to go. Um, uh, and it's very extremely useful for demos, obviously. Um, so we'll jump out of that. So that's a really useful application that comes as free with the Pi um, and uh, is great to use. So the other thing you can use the Pi for and something that's quite popular is to use it as a data modes workstation. So rather than having your main computer tied up doing data modes, you could just use a Raspberry Pi. Um, <clears throat> in order to do that, you need audio in and out from the Pi because the way we do data modes these days is we use an SSB transmitter and we send tones in to make the transmit signal and re receive tones back to get the receive signal. So you need um, a USB sound card. I use a simple one from Ugreen, um, which is perfectly adequate. It costs between 10 and 20 pounds, depending on where you go for it. And uh, it really works a treat. For those of you who've got more modern rigs, um, most of them these days have a USB connector already built in and you'll find that they've got an audio card built in and they've got uh, a serial to USB adapter to handle the cat controls. So if you've got one of those, you don't even need an external sound card. All you need is a USB connection from the Pi to your rig. Um, now, all the following software is stuff that I've tested and regularly use and works very well with the Pi. So WSJTX, which is the standard for all the weak signal stations, including uh, FT8, FT4. Uh, and you install an upgrade from the WSJT site. They've got instructions on there. It's really easy. FLDigi covers a whole load of the other data modes, the more traditional ones like PSK31 and RITI and all those sorts of things. Um, if you want the latest version, you have to build it from source, which can get a bit messy. But if you go to this site, indieham.com, there's a guy there who's written a script that you can download that will actually fully install FLDigi for you. Uh, if you fancy a bit of... Uh, slow scan tv then qss tv is a great application and there's good instructions on the author site as to how to build it um, and um, jtdx is uh, another variant of a wsjtx system that a lot of people like that works on the pi fine and that's how you install it uh, and if you enjoy packet radio and APRS and all that, then Direwolf is the one to go for. And that also has, um, you have to build the latest version from source, but there's good instructions on the author's site. Um, and finally, CQR log is a very good and comprehensive logging system, uh, Linux based log logging system. Um, version 2.3, which is the older version, is available from the Pi repository. And you can think of the Pi repository a bit like the iStore for Apple, etc. It's somewhere where approved applications are held that you can download very easily. And one trick to get the latest version is to install the old one from the repository and then, and then build the new one on top of it. That way you have all the prerequisites already installed from the first one. Um, and that can help with a lot of systems when you want to upgrade.
Uh, the script is going to be on my site. I know I said this when I did the RSGB presentation and I noticed tonight I haven't actually put it up yet. So I will put it up after this. Uh, and the other thing that I do um, as a service for radio amateurs, uh, I supply ready loaded micro SD cards because um, I know a lot of people don't want to get involved in any of this installed in all this software and would rather have something they can plug in and use, get on and use the Pi. So that's why I do this. Um, so um, that's where you can get them from. Uh, I've got about four or five different types of cards on there. They're all preloaded as much as I can. All you need to do generally is to put in your call sign details and all the rest of it. And um, they're £9.50 with free postage. And for that, you get a 16 gig class 10 SD card, along with 10 pages of printed information on how to use it. Um, so they're quite popular. So enough advertising. Let me just show you. Uh, so if I go into, uh, let's go into this one. This one, I've got all sorts running at the moment, but what I'll do, I'll just, other than these two screens, which is um, a couple of SDR receivers running, which I'll cover in a minute. This is the way the data programs are all installed. So you just go up radio programs and you've got all the programs sat there, uh, ready to roll. Uh, it just makes it really easy for those that don't want to get tied up in the system uh, and um, and just want to get on with using them. So let's disconnect out of that for the moment. Go back into the presentation. So when it comes to SDR applications, um, up until about the Pi 3 or 4, it was really limited, to be honest, because it was straining what could be done with a Raspberry Pi uh, to try and get it to do SDR work. <clears throat> but having said that, they all work, even the Pi 1 works very well um, serving data from an RTL SDL uh, dongle. I'm sure you're all familiar with these. This is the little 10 pound dongle um, that works well as a VHF, UHF, SDR dongle. And the, um, the use of a dongle server is actually quite useful because it enables you to put that receiver on your local network so you can actually use it from anywhere on your local network. So you connect the dongle to the Pi, run it as a server, and then you can sit out in the garden with your laptop and listen to the, um, whatever the dongle's tuned to. And you can tune the dongle and operate it as normal. So you can do that, say, with SDR Sharp. Um, and that works really well. The other way you can use it is if you're into um, UHF stuff, then feeder losses are a problem. So what you can actually do is put the RTL dongle right up close to the antenna and just have the um, Ethernet cable coming down to uh, supply the data. So Ethernet cable is a lot cheaper than low-loss um, coax. So that's another way of using it. So this is, this is how you set it up. Um, so it's literally that cheap Cat5 cable between the, um, the Pi and the um, dongle. And you can send power up the, the line as well. It sends the IQ data back. You inject power here to keep it going over spare pairs in the Ethernet cable. And uh, then you can receive, whoops. You can receive it with any computer connected to your local network. And that really works very well. So the alternative to that, and more sophisticated alternative to that, is the um, SPY server that was produced by the uh, AirSPY team. So this supports all the AirSPY receivers, as well as RTL, SDL uh, dongles. And it enables internet sharing. One of the problems with uh, trying to share an, internet, uh, an SDR receiver over the internet is that it requires a huge bandwidth, and it requires a bandwidth that often isn't available. Um, but um, Yusuf, who produced this, has come up with a neat way of cutting down the bandwidth requirement without actually compromising on the SDR. So in a typical setup, um, 
you would maybe use an ASPI set to two and a half megs bandwidth. It could be an ASPI Mini or a full ASPI. And that would require something like 80 megabits per second of continuous uh, Ethernet bandwidth. Now, you're not really going to get that over the internet, over the wider internet as you move around. So the alternative way of doing it, which is used in the SPI server, is as follows. You start off with your two and a half megabits, but it goes to a Raspberry Pi and it splits. <clears throat> so the first split it does is it, the Raspberry Pi downsamples that 2.5 megs to round about 15 kilohertz. Uh, so if you're receiving SSB, it's a 15 kilohertz chunk. So it puts it into a data combiner. And then on the other side, it uses the Raspberry Pi to build a FFT frame, which is like your spectrum display that you're used to seeing, for the whole of the two and a half megabits. That then is combined with the data combiner and sent back to the computer. And then on the computer, when you're using SDR Sharp, you have the same display as if you were using it direct, i.e. you've got the full two and a half megs of spectrum that you can look at, but you only demodulate the bit you need for the signal you're tuned into. And by doing that, it reduces the data demand down to somewhere in the region of sort of four to four, four to 500 kilobits a second, which is eminently doable uh, on this. And what it will also support is multiple connections. You can set how many, <clears throat> but you can have multiple people use the same receiver on the SPI server. The only proviso when you do that is that the frequency band is locked. So you still can tune anywhere in the two, two megs bandwidth, but you can't change the center point of the two megs bandwidth if you've got two people on there. If there's only one people person, you can. If there was two or more people on trying to change the center frequency, it would be chaos, of course. So that, that's why that limitation is there. But that's a really neat system. <clears throat> Now, the other thing you can do, and something I've got running here, is um, with the APRS uh, network, um, getting adequate coverage is quite tricky. And one of the ways to increase the coverage is to put up your own receive-only iGate node. And what this does is it receives APRS signals and sends them over the internet to a central um, APRS server, which distributes it for everyone else. So it's a really useful way of adding an extra node into the network. And you can do it with just about any Pi model and an RTL SDR dongle. The ideal setup, I reckon, is a Pi 0W and an RTL SDR dongle, because all you need to do is supply power to that and an aerial and you're in business. Uh, in order to make this work, it uses uh, a software package called RTLFM, um, which is a well-known package that was, is produced for the RTL dongles, and the Direwolf packet software. Uh, so here's a block diagram of how it works. So there's the dongle with its uh, antenna. It goes into the Raspberry Pi, and the RTLFM program receives um, the... IQ samples from the dongle and resolves an FM sync signal and passes it digitally to the Direwolf software. So there's no demodulate into audio and then back out again. It goes directly to the Direwolf and the Direwolf sends it out through the iGate servers. So it's a really cheap and neat way of adding a node um, to um, your, your location. And that's all you need. Simple as that. <clears throat> that's the Pi Zero W and an RTL dongle. Um, so that's quite a neat way of, um, of using a, a basic Pi. So moving on to more interesting or more advanced um, <clears throat> SDR applications. So um, many of you would have heard of um, high performance SDR based projects. Probably the one uh, you're they're all Ethernet. The ones you're most familiar will be those from Apache Labs, the, the Anand series of transceivers, etc., which were all based on the HPSDR project. But there's also a design called the Hermes Light, which is a branch out of that project, which is a wonderful little transceiver. And also the Radioberry 2, 
um, which goes on the Pi, which is a wonderful little thing. So the Hermes Light 2, of which I've got one here, <clears throat> is, is, uses the same principles as the Anon transceivers, but they used a 12-bit cable modem instead of using 16-bit standard um, analog to digital converters. But it's been extremely well designed, and it makes a complete 5-watt um, transceiver from LF to 30 megs. Um, and you can get... Um, uh, a filter board designed by uh, N2 ADR that works in harmony with this. And it makes a fantastic little um, software defined uh, transceiver for about 300 pounds. Now, it's currently available from Maker Fabs in China because uh, the team that have been doing this have sourced these from, uh, from China. But this firm is a really good Chinese firm. They've been around a long time and they produce good quality stuff. So this is a picture of the Hermes light transceiver. The board on the left is the Hermes light itself. And then in the middle here is a little Vera board connecting board that joins all the outputs of the Hermes light directly into this, which is the filter block on the right. Um, this is my own setup here. And it's a little Euro, Euro card box and uh, it really works brilliantly. Um, and uh, for, for, about 300 pounds i reckon that's a really good uh, transceiver and, and this board if you buy it from maker fags uh, fabs comes fully assembled all you have to do um, from memory is to wind that coil down there the pa coil and install it and i think you have to solder in just the connectors on the edge uh, which is the ethernet jack and the power jack great little transceiver that one the Radio Berry 2 is based on the Hermes light, but what, um, what they did is move all the processing and network co connectivity into the Pi. So it mounts on top of a Pi using the GPIO pins. Uh, and you can use it with all sorts of things. It's only got a very low power output. It's about 100 milliwatts output. So you need something extra to make a complete transceiver. Uh, and it's homebrew only at the moment, but... Um, and it's um, quite small components, but I managed to do it with my 71-year-old eyes, so there's no excuses. So, <laughs> so that's the board. You can see it there sat on top of a Raspberry Pi. Um, th this link was the only mod you have to do to the current board because there was a change to the software or the firmware in this um, FPGA here. It just needed that link. Um, and that's it, the two SMA sockets here, one's for the receive and one's for the transmit. Uh, and it makes a really uh, neat little thing and the performance is quite amazing for what it is. I think that one from memory will cost around 200 to build, but it's a lovely little device. If you like playing building receivers and transceivers, it's, uh, it's well worth a crack. <clears throat> so, now moving on to how do you control these transceivers? So thankfully, um, John Melton has been very generous um, with his time and has developed some excellent software to work with HPSDR transceivers, um, including the Anand range as well. It works with all of them. The Pi HPSDR has been specifically designed to work with the Pi touchscreen. You can actually buy this as a standalone unit ready assembled for controlling Anand transceivers. Um, and this runs on a Pi 3 or 4, and uh, it supports all sorts of manual controls as well. So you can have a great big tuning dial if you want. Uh, it's really good. The other one that I found perhaps more useful is called Lin HPSDR. And as you can guess from the way the name's put together, it's also written by the same guy. It's designed uh, based on Pi HPSDR, but it's been designed for a desktop. So you've got much, much more space. Uh, to operate, which makes it much easier. It runs happily on a Pi 4, and I can show you that here. You did get a sneak preview earlier. Um, this one, so if we connect into this and go full scale. So here, <clears throat> it supports two receivers. So this is, this is running on a Hermes Light 2. And because the Hermes Light 2 is a wideband transceiver, it does 0 to 30 megs, you can tune to anywhere in its band. So the 
one here I've got tuned to 20 meters, one's tuned to 40 meters. Uh, and as you can see, they're chuntering along quite well. Your display may well look a little bit jerky because what you've got to remember here is that this is running on a Pi being piped over uh, a VNC link to here and then going over Zoom. So, um, but I can assure you on the Pi itself, this is running very smoothly. Um, and you can e even add here, you can put in, this is asking for trouble, I guess. You can put in a wideband display. So this is looking at, um, it shows 0 to 60 megs, but this receiver actually finishes at 30 megs. So you can see um, a full spectrum display. And if you look at how the Pi is handling that, up the top here, that's the processor load. So even with all that lot running, it's still running at 55%. So it can handle this quite happily. Um, in fact, it can handle the data modes. Um, so you can run WSJTX on top of this as well, and it will work fine. Uh, <clears throat> ideally, though, if you're starting to run these receivers, plus you've got WSJTX and something else on, maybe the login program open, that's where having the two display ports for the Pi really pays off because you can spread these screens across two 4K or HD monitors and make a much more organized um, layout. So um, let's just pull down from that. Disconnect that one, get back to the presentation. Okay, so that's done that demo. So um, if you want to play SDRs and you've got an assortment of little SDR modules around like um, Air Spies and, and uh, things like that, um, there's a guy who's produced a very nice Raspbian image, which has got a whole load of SDR applications already installed on it. He's got SDR Angel, Soapy Remote, and GQRX uh, included, and GNU Radio, which is great fun. So this is all included on an image which is free to download. Uh, it will also s support uh, Lime. It's got a Lime VNA in there as well, Vector Network Analyzer in there. So I can thoroughly recommend that. I've sent the, you don't need to scrabble to write these down, by the way, because um, Dave has got all these links. I sent them through to him earlier, so I'm sure he'll send them out to you. But um, so let's have a quick demo of that now. So if we go to that one, I think we did have a quick dip into this earlier. <clears throat> so here we go. So this is this is the screen as it starts up. We're into that one now. So if we go to GQRX, um, by the way, if you run programs on a Pi and you get irritated by this coming up, I know a lot of people do, you can turn this off if you like. If you go to File Manager, oops, it's not Tools, it's Preferences, it's <clears throat> um, that option there, don't ask options on launch of an execut executable file. Um, I know it can be difficult to find the answer to that one. I know several people have got stumped with it, but that's quite handy to know. <clears throat> um, I often run as execute in terminal because what this does, as you'll see, when a program starts, you get all the um, information from the program as it's starting up. So it's particularly useful if you've got any problems with the program, you can see all the error messages come up as you write it, as you start it. So here we've got um, GQRX, and uh, I can't remember what we we'll start to. Oh, it's got an uh, AirSpy HF Plus connected to it. So if we just hit the play button up here, with a bit of luck, it will get going. So here we are on, this is on 20 meters with uh, good old FT8 running well. Um, so we can uh, take a zoom in on that if we like, get a closer look. Again, this will probably look a little bit jerky to you, but it's not jerky on the machine. Now, I know a lot of people have had problems getting GQRX running successfully. Um, and the thing to note about the one he's got running here is he's, he's built the latest version, which seems to run much better than some of the earlier versions on a Pi. Um, so if you want to try 
G, uh, GQRX as an SDR receiver to work with some of your air spies and RTL dongles and that sort of thing. It might be worth using this image because it does seem to work remarkably well. So we'll stop that there. Um, now it's also got GNU ra radio, <clears throat> which is a great application. Um, I don't know if any of you have come across it. I suspect you have. There's been a lot of press. Uh, the RSGB have done um, a tutorial on it before the last um, uh, convention. The thing about um, GNU Radio, as you can see, it's a flowchart-based application where you can build your own radio applications. And you literally just drop blocks in here and connect them together. Um, and, and what this little block here is, is I've got a signal source that I've, I've created, which uh, this is one of their tutorials, by the way, it's not me being clever. Um, and you can put in here what frequency you want, the amplitude you want it to be, etc. This little device is just to stop it taking over your processor so you can still do things while it's running. And this here is um, going to be an oscilloscope display. So if when we put all these things together, we just hit the run button, it will run the program and produce a sine wave. So <clears throat> very simple application, but you could use this to maybe connect to say a Pluto SDR module and generate an RF signal. Um, you can do all sorts of things. There's a huge range of blocks available. And the great beauty about building bits of a receiver like this is that each of these modules has been thoroughly tested and proven. So you ha don't have to write all the individual bits of software. You just connect all the bits of software together that you want to use to make your um, receiver. And in fact, um, GQRX, which I showed you just now, is based on the modules in GNU Radio that you see here. So it's a really, really useful tool and well worth spending some time on if you like experimenting with SDR software. And by putting it on the Pi, the great thing is you can get in a right mess and it doesn't really matter because you can just change the SD card and go back to square one. So, um, yeah, it really works a treat. So that's a, that's a great image to get and it's completely free download off the internet. Um, and... Um, I thoroughly recommend that as, uh, as well worth doing. So let's get back to the presentation. I think we're getting somewhere near the end now. We're glad to know. <laughs> so we've done that. Yes, we are. <clears throat> so what I've tried to show you here, that there's lots of radio applications for the Raspberry Pi, and I've only scratched the surface here. There's lots of stuff, uh, other things that can be done as well. Um, the Pi 4 has transformed the Pi because it's so much more powerful. A lot of the bottlenecks and problems that the previous versions have been uh, um, overcome. <clears throat> it's a great tool to learn programming as well uh, because you've got so many programming tools in there and there's no fear of messing up the system if you go wrong because you just put another operating system in. So here's a few links um, just to get you started. Whoops. Um, but Dave has got a much more complete set of links that he would doubtless send out to you. So I think that's probably about enough for me in this session, Dave. <laughs> I hope that's okay. You're very silent. That's great. That's great. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I was... <laughs> Uh, with regards to the links, what I'm actually going to do, and uh, I see Andrew here on the call as well, VGV, I'm going to put them on our club website and create and uh, and ask. Uh, well, when I say I'm going to, I'm going to ask Andrew because he he is our <laughs> webman um, to put them on our our website under a separate page. Um, uh, if yep. no one has the website address, it's www.muarc.com. Um, so, uh, before we go any further, uh, for absolutely fantastic, Mike. My first question would be, is there literally anything that the Pi cannot do? <laughs> uh, well, and, and then the floor is open to anyone who, with uh, yeah. questions. If you're if you're into heavy processing of some sort, then it might struggle a bit. 
you, you can liken it to the power of a, a cheap laptop, if you like, um, in terms of its processing power. But you can do a huge range of things with it, to be honest, because it's now got to a state with this, the latest quad core processor that it, um, it's a useful computer in its own right. Prior to this, it was an experimenter's computer, but now you could use it as a useful computer on its own. Gonna make tea? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can send an email to Elaine and ask me to make one. You'd be a brave man. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. Mind you, I expect there's someone out there who's worked out a way to make it make tea as well. <laughs> That's the other thing about it, which I haven't mentioned. The, the support for the Raspberry Pi is phenomenal because it's being used in schools and universities as well as with all sorts of electronic hobbyists the amount of support information available is amazing. Um, you can always find some sort of answer to what you're doing. And if you're, if you're coming up with a new project, you will find that lumps of it will already be written for you. So you can use other people's software to write parts of the program for you. And all you're doing really is bolting blocks together to make your program. Um, so yeah, really good support. To it, Mike, just a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, I've seen your presentation a couple of times, but the more you watch a presentation, the more you learn and the more sick <laughs> on. I have a Raspberry Pi Zero W lying in the yep. box in the house since I got it. And <laughs> I did say in the last call that Nathan done, I'm going to do something with this one instead of give away my pies like I have done in the past. All right. So the I get that's APRS, is it? or It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so 144.8 the frequency. I just that's need a two meter antenna and a, an RTL dongle, and away you go. Yep, yep. Um, I I've think that's got, what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, I've done the instructions on how to do it. I did it in PW. I did an article in PW about it. I can send something over to you if you need it. I also which, do a pre-done card, which has got, um, got it in. Right, okay. Yeah, great. Lovely, thank yeah. you. No problem. Uh, Terry, G3VFC, good evening. Hello, Terry. Hi. Um, yes, I watched your previous uh, presentation a week or three earlier. Um, now you're talking about the, the Pi 4B. Um, is your book up to date with that? Or is, yes. Uh, okay, so I, did, I can buy with alacrity then. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah they um because i it took me um steve probably knows this uh mark algar was probably tearing his hair out with me because uh every year he watched the deadline whistle by <laughs> um because it took me a while it probably took me three years to write this book um because writing a computer book if any anyone's ever tried it is a blooming nightmare because everything's changing all the time and uh, I was holding on at the end because I was sure we were due to get a new Pi. All the rumours said that one was coming. So I waited until the new Pi 4 was out. And then I, I wrote a whole load of stuff, including the Pi 4, and updated the previous stuff so that it included the Pi 4. So, yeah, it's fully up to date with the Pi 4. Absolutely well done. Thank you, Mike. It's okay. Uh, Any more? It's very quiet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> They're not usually this quiet, you know. We literally yeah. have the author here of the book. <laughs> Any problems with your having with your pies, whatever, um, feel free, ask away. Yeah, and, and if, if, you're, um, if you've got the book, by the way, and I think it's selling quite well, but if you've got the book, I've set up a support site for it on Groups.io, there's a there's a a, a group called um, Raspberry Pi Explained, which is my group. So any errors in the book, and there haven't been too many so far, I'm pleased to say, I report any errors in there, and it's also somewhere where people who are maybe struggling with something or want some more information can get directly through to me. I also don't mind emails, to be honest, if you if you've got a problem. But um, yeah, I've used that as a forum to support the book so that any people with problems, the idea is that people can help each other uh, rather than it just being all falling on me. But um, uh, it's also a useful place to report and hold all the um, errors that we've <laughs> managed to find. 
most of them are simple typos where because the problem we're trying to get computer programs printed is that a space and the odd dot and the odd capital can completely screw things up so and it's very easy for things to slip through the net i'm gi at mov just wanted to ask about um amateur television is there much of a um, take up in that line with the uh, uh, yeah the batc guys are using it um uh because they're, they're going for the um line boards there's two two important boards if you like kicking around that appeal to people that are dealing with vhf uhf and beyond uh, and that's the analog devices pluto board or development kit and the lime sdr stuff and i know that the batc guys are doing work with that uh, with their uh, digital tv transmitters etc so uh, is work, go and have a look on the BATC site. Um, they do a, their membership is really really cheap, and they do an excellent magazine with loads and loads of information in that's well worth getting. Thanks. It's okay. Hi, Mike. It's Andre GI Zero PGV. Um, Mike, you'd mentioned about the um, external boots. So at the moment, most of the pies need an SD card. To yep. boot, um, I think the external boot is only coming out for the. Is it for the Pi Four? Uh, it's. I don't think it's been released at all yet. I think it's. It's on. It's going to be on the Pi Four. It's already on the Pi Three. If you've got a Pi Three, it already supports boot from a, a USB drive. So, but the the uh, Pi Four doesn't. So the main uh, addition is to get it working on the Pi Four. Uh, there is a beta version that you can get to now, uh, a beta version of the firmware where you can use it. You, you can, of course, still boot from the, uh, a Pi 4 from a, a USB drive now. You just have to put change the code on the uh, card, the SD card a little bit. So what it does, it looks at the SD card and that tells it to go off to the hard drive and boot from there. So um, it is quite easy to make it boot from a hard drive now, but it doesn't automatically boot from a hard drive, if you see what I mean. Sure. I have a, a Pi 2, and obviously that's mm. not supported. So what yep. I've done um, is, oh, is uh, attach uh, a laptop drive with uh, USB cables. Yeah. It's not a really good picture. And um, it actually speeds up the Pi quite a bit because obviously the external drive is faster than an SD card. So yes. it makes it a lot more usable. Yes. Yeah, it will speed loading of programs primarily. Yeah. For um, for things like amateur radio software, stuff like WSJTX and the like, um, it'll only speed the loading. It won't in sp yeah. speed the operation because once it's loaded, it operates entirely in memory. But um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's worth doing if you're if you're using the Pi seriously for all these sorts of things and you're likely to store data and you want to be able to switch programs easily. Then then yeah, I mean I've got a little. I'm just trying to find it here. Um, <clears throat> I, I bought a little 128 gig SSD from Amazon. It's about 30 quid. Um, yeah. And that's ideal for a, a Pi. Um, it's really good. Yep. Good. Eh? Any more? <laughs> Hi, Mike. It's George GI for SJK. Hello, I was George. wondering about the um, POE. Power over yes. Ethernet on the Pi. I yep. uh, had been thinking of a project with a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4 and an RTL SDR dongle and remoting it uh, using Ethernet and running PoE to, to power it. Just yep. wondering about the uh, voltage drop across the cable and is it able to accommodate that? <clears throat> yeah, the way, um, the way PoE works, if, you're, um, if you use the um, commercial power over Ethernet, it usually works on 48 volts. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you've got an Ethernet switch with PoE on it, there'll be 48 volts coming out of that. And you can buy, um, I've got one here, a little TP-Link adapter that you put at the far end. You plug the Ethernet cable into that, and it drops it down to a regulated 5 volts that you can put in the Pi. Ah, right, okay. So that way you could use 
if you've got commercial grade uh, power over ethernet available. The other way to do it, which I've shown in the book and I've used on some of my presentations, is as you're only using 100 megabit uh, of ethernet, you've got two spare pairs in a standard Cat5 cable. And what you can do is bunch two pairs together, okay, and use that to feed DC down. But what I do is send 12 volts down and then use a little switch mode converter down to five volts at the pi end of things. Okay. Um, yeah, it's no good trying to send five volts down because the volt drop would be hopeless. Um, it wouldn't work. No, but if 12 volts works really well, just get 12 volts down there. Yeah. One of these yeah, regulators on the end and it's fine. Okay, that, no, that's good. I was just wondering about, as I say, about uh, with uh, the long length of cable and uh, the size of the conductors, you'd, you'd have a bit of uh, voltage loss across it. Yeah, that's right. No, you're quite right. Yeah, yeah, and that's the way to overcome it. I, either do, I do it yourself. One, you can also get um, if you don't want to um, do your own uh, Ethernet wiring, you can get what are called PoE injectors and extractors, and all they are is um, a little plug and socket that you put the Ethernet cable in, and it extracts out uh, a power line. Yeah. And it actually takes the spare pairs for you. Oh, there's someone got one up there. Who's got one? Other? Andrew's got one. That's that's the beastie. Yeah. That will that will do the job. Okay. Um, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, that's the easy way to do that. Okay. Uh, Mike J, uh, Jack G I four L V C. Hello, to, Jack. Just to thank you for the evening. I've got to pull out. I have another meeting to go to but thank you very much and thanks again pleasure. Love for hosting it that's a pleasure thank you very much Jack. <clears throat> any more for any more yeah jeff gi0 lam on one okay. of your one of your demos you showed that you plugged a board on top of the the pie itself yeah um, does that present a problem with cooling uh no not if you've got a fan if you've got that little fan on it's still okay oh, wow. uh, yeah yeah but you do need um particularly on the pi 4 if you put one of these boards any of the boards that plug in on top you really need to think about getting some air moving and um the little that that little pi um fan shim uh really works a treat um it's the best solution i've found to be honest um uh, and it's quick and easy. That's the other nice thing about it. You can just mm -hmm. pop it on a board and uh, away you go. Um, and it's only about nine pounds or something. So it's a good price as well. It was one of the first Thank solutions you. that came out, actually, which is quite surprising. Yeah. I think it's still the best. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for the lecture. That's okay. Pleasure. Any more? Mike, another uh, project, I don't know whether you're aware, is Satnox. They yeah. exclusively use um, a Raspberry Pi and an RTL dongle to monitor satellites. Yeah. Um, they, they produce um, an image that you can just download and run, register in the site, and away you go. Yeah, yeah, that's another good application. I said I've really only scratched the surface because there are, there are loads. Um, you can do airplane aircraft tracking as well. You know, a, a Pi Aware is a, a common one which uses an RTL dongle or a Pi and will receive all the ADSB traffic from local aircraft and wing it away off to the um, um, uh, Flight Aware site. Uh, but you also get a display on your screen on your computer as well, so you can see all the local aircraft. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is a huge range. I could probably talk all night about different applications of the Pi and still not cover them. <laughs> um, yeah, you can use it for hotspots as well, for DMR and all the rest of it. Yeah. And they work very well on the hotspots. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It sounds well, like we're coming to an end. Yeah, if there's no further <laughs> questions, uh, what I would say, folks, is the links there, I'm going to stick them up on our club website, www.mearc forward slash 
let's call it pie, forward slash pie. Is that possible, Andy? <laughs> you can nod if we can do that. Yes. So <laughs> merc.com forward slash pi pi uh, and uh, we'll have a bit of uh, the links there we'll also uh, do a link to uh, your book through the rsb shop there uh, and okay. uh, anyone who is looking to get that book can go there uh, what i will yeah. say as well uh, we do have our youtube channel uh, please go please go to youtube you would help us out a lot uh, and like and subscribe uh, to our channel. You can catch all the rest of the uh, different uh, lectures that have been before. I think we're on some like 36, 37 subscribers. Once we get to 100, we get our own link uh, on YouTube. So uh, right. that's that's the short term <laughs> goal. Um, so shameless plug there. YouTube forward slash uh, or, or search for MEARC and you'll come to our Tuesday night lecture channel. Uh, this should be up as well, Mike, uh, for your info, probably in this time tomorrow night. Uh, this lecture so uh you can uh, have a look at it again <laughs> <laughs> then tomorrow night uh, and feel free as well everyone to pass it on to folks who aren't here mm -hmm. uh, or to other clubs and everything else so uh mike again from myself and the team uh which i will introduce right now we have george uh gi4 sjq uh phillips hiding in the background there uh <laughs> depending on which uh identity he's using this evening mi0 mso m0 mso or ei at gpb um <laughs> he, he's eating his dinner there and uh Caught in traffic on the way home. We haven't got uh, this evening there. Jamie, uh, MI7 FAC, who does all our video editing on the YouTube and uh, is great. Uh, together we put together this uh, Tuesday night lecture series. So uh, from all of us, thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. And, My pleasure. Uh, we, thank you. We've, we've really enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully uh, you have too. So folks, uh, yep. feel free. Thank you. Uh, and uh, <laughs> thanks very much okay. again, Mike. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, see you Mike. all. Okay, cheers. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.